Chapter Twenty Three of the Haunted Hotel. You have some influence over Agnes. Try what you can do, Henry, to make her take a sensible view of the matter. There is really nothing to make a fuss about. My wife's maid knocked at her door early in the morning with a customary cup of tea. Getting no answer, she went round to the dressing room, found the door on that side unlocked, and discovered Agnes on the bed in a fainting fit. With my wife's help, they brought her to herself again, and she told the extraordinary story which I have just repeated to you. You must have seen for yourself that she has been over-fatigued, poor thing, by our long railway journeys. Her nerves are out of order, and she is just the person to be easily terrified by a dream. She obstinately refuses, however, to accept this rational view. Don't suppose that I have been severe with her. All that a man can do to humor her I have done. I have written to the Countess in her assumed name, offering to restore the room to her. She writes back, positively declining to return to it. I have accordingly arranged, so as not to have the thing known in the hotel, to occupy the room for one or two nights, and to leave Agnes to recover her spirits under my wife's care. Is there anything more that I can do? Whatever questions Agnes has asked of me I have answered to the best of my ability. She knows all that you told me about Francis and the Countess last night. But, try as I may, I can't quiet her mind. I have given up the attempt in despair and left her in the drawing-room. Go like a good fellow and try what you can do to compose her. In those words, Lord Montbarry stated the case to his brother from the rational point of view. Henry made no remark. He went straight to the drawing-room. He found Agnes walking rapidly backwards and forwards, flushed and excited. "'If you come here to say what your brother has been saying to me,' she broke out before he could speak, "'spare yourself the trouble. I don't want common sense. I want a true friend who will believe in me.' "'I am that friend, Agnes,' Henry answered quietly, and you know it. "'You really believe that I am not deluded by a dream?' I know that you are not deluded in one particular, at least. In what particular? In what you have said of the Countess. It is perfectly true. Agnes stopped him there. Why do I only hear this morning that the Countess and Mrs. James are one and the same person? She asked, distrustfully. Why was I not told of it last night? You forget that you had accepted the exchange of rooms before I reached Venice. Henry replied, I felt strongly tempted to tell you, even then, but your sleeping arrangements for the night were all made. I should only have inconvenienced and alarmed you. I waited till the morning, after hearing from my brother, that you had yourself seen to your security from any intrusion. How that intrusion was accomplished, it is impossible to say. I can only declare that the Countess's presence by your bedside last night was no dream of yours. On her own authority I can testify that it was a reality. On her own authority? Agnes repeated eagerly. Have you seen her this morning? I have seen her not ten minutes since. What was she doing? She was busily engaged in writing. I could not even get her to look at me until I thought of mentioning your name. She remembered me, of course. She remembered you with some difficulty. Finding that she wouldn't answer me on any other terms, I questioned her as if I had come direct from you. Then she spoke. She not only admitted that she had the same superstitious motive for placing you in that room which she had acknowledged to Francis, she even owned that she had been by your bedside watching through the night to see what you saw, as she expressed it. Hearing this, I tried to persuade her to tell me how she got into the room. Unluckily, her manuscript on the table caught her eye. She returned to her writing. The Baron wants money, she said. I must get on with my play. What she saw or dreamed while she was in your room last night, it is at present impossible to discover. But judging by my brother's account of her, as well as by what I remember of her myself, some recent influence has been at work which has produced a marked change in this wretched woman for the worse. Her mind, since last night, perhaps, is partially deranged. One proof of it is that she spoke to me of the Baron as if he were still a living man. 
When Francis saw her, she declared that the Baron was dead, which is the truth. The United States Consul at Milan showed us the announcement of the death in an American newspaper. So far as I can see, such sense as she still possesses seems to be entirely absorbed in one absurd idea, the idea of writing a play for Francis to bring out at his theatre. He admits that he encouraged her to hope she might get money in this way. I think he did wrong. Don't you agree with me? Without heeding the question, Agnes rose abruptly from her chair. "'Do me one more kindness, Henry,' she said. "'Take me to the Countess at once.' Henry hesitated. "'Are you composed enough to see her after the shock that you have suffered?' he asked. She trembled. The flush on her face died away and left it deadly pale. But she held to her resolution. "'You have heard of what I saw last night?' she said faintly. "'Don't speak of it,' Henry interposed. "'Don't uselessly agitate yourself. "'I must speak. "'My mind is full of horrid questions about it. "'I know I can't identify it, "'and yet I ask myself over and over again, "'in whose likeness did it appear? "'Was it in the likeness of Ferrari, or was it—' "'She stopped, shuddering. "'The Countess knows. "'I must see the Countess.' she resumed vehemently. Whether my courage fails me or not, I must make the attempt. Take me to her before I have time to feel afraid of it. Henry looked at her anxiously. If you are really sure of your own resolution, he said, I agree with you. The sooner you see her, the better. You remember how strangely she talked of your influence over her when she forced her way into your room in London. I remember it perfectly. Why do you ask? For this reason, in the present state of her mind, I doubt if she will be much longer capable of realizing her wild idea of you as the avenging angel who is to bring her to a reckoning for her evil deeds. It may be well to try what your influence can do, while she is still capable of feeling it. He waited to hear what Agnes would say. She took his arm and led him in silence to the door. They ascended to the second floor and, after knocking, entered the Countess's room. She was still busily engaged in writing. When she looked up from the paper and saw Agnes, a vacant expression of doubt was the only expression in her wild, black eyes. After a few moments, the lost remembrances and associations appeared to return slowly to her mind. The pen dropped from her hand. Haggard and trembling, she looked closer at Agnes and recognized her at last. "'Has the time come already?' she said in low, awestruck tones. "'Give me a little longer respite. I haven't done my writing yet.' She dropped on her knees and held out her clasped hands entreatingly. Agnes was far from having recovered after the shock that she had suffered in the night. Her nerves were far from being equal to the strain that was now laid on them. She was so startled by the change in the Countess that she was at a loss what to say or to do next. Henry was obliged to speak to her. "'Put your questions while you have the chance,' he said, lowering his voice. "'See, the vacant look is coming over her face again.' Agnes tried to rally her courage. "'You were in my room last night,' she began. Before she could add a word more, the Countess lifted her hands and wrung them above her head with a low moan of horror. Agnes shrank back and turned as if to leave the room. Henry stopped her and whispered to her to try again. She obeyed him after an effort. "'I slept last night in the room that you gave up to me.' she resumed. I saw. The countess suddenly rose to her feet. No more of that, she cried. Oh, Jesu Maria, do you think I want to be told what you saw? Do you think I don't know what it means for you and for me? Decide for yourself, miss. Examine your own mind. Are you well assured that the day of reckoning has come at last? Are you ready to follow me back, through the crimes of the past, to the secrets of the dead? She returned again to the writing-table, without waiting to be answered. 
Her eyes flashed. She looked like her old self once more. She spoke. It was only for a moment. The old ardor and impetuosity were nearly worn out. Her head sank. She sighed heavily as she unlocked a desk which stood on the table. Opening a drawer in the desk, she took out a leaf of vellum covered with faded writing. Some ragged ends of silken thread were still attached to the leaf, as if it had been torn out of a book. "'Can you read Italian?' she asked, handing the leaf to Agnes. Agnes answered silently by an inclination of her head. The leaf, the countess proceeded, once belonged to a book in the old library of the palace, while this building was still a palace. By whom it was torn out you have no need to know. For what purpose it was torn out you may discover for yourself, if you will. Read it first, at the fifth line from the top of the page. Agnes felt the serious necessity of composing herself. "'Give me a chair,' she said to Henry, "'and I will do my best.' He placed himself behind her chair so that he could look over her shoulder and help her to understand the writing on the leaf. Rendered into English, it ran as follows. I have now completed my literary survey of the first floor of the palace. At the desire of my noble and gracious patron, the lord of this glorious edifice, I next ascend to the second floor and continue my catalogue or description of the pictures, decorations, and other treasures of art therein contained. Let me begin with the corner room at the western extremity of the palace, called the Room of the Caryatids from the statues which support the mantelpiece. This work is of comparatively recent execution. It dates from the eighteenth century only, and reveals the corrupt taste of the period in every part of it. Still there is a certain interest which attaches to the mantelpiece. It conceals a cleverly constructed hiding-place between the floor of the room and the ceiling of the room beneath, which was made during the last evil days of the Inquisition in Venice, and which is reported to have saved an ancestor of my gracious lord pursued by that terrible tribunal. The machinery of this curious place of concealment has been kept in good order by the present lord as a species of curiosity. He condescended to show me the method of working it. Approaching the two caryatids, rest your hand on the forehead midway between the eyebrows of the figure which is on your left as you stand opposite to the fireplace, then press the head inwards as if you were pushing it against the wall behind. By doing this you set in motion the hidden machinery in the wall which turns the hearthstone on a pivot and discloses the hollow place below. There is room enough in it for a man to lie easily at full length. The method of closing the cavity again is equally simple. Place both your hands on the temples of the figures, pull as if you were pulling it towards you, and the hearthstone will revolve into its proper position again. "'You need read no farther,' said the Countess. "'Be careful to remember what you have read.' She put back the page of vellum in her writing-desk, locked it, and led the way to the door. "'Come,' she said, and see what the mocking Frenchman called the beginning of the end. Agnes was barely able to rise from her chair. She trembled from head to foot. Henry gave her his arm to support her. "'Fear nothing,' he whispered. "'I shall be with you.' The countess proceeded along the westward corridor and stopped at the door numbered thirty-eight. This was the room which had been inhabited by Baron Rivar in the old days of the palace. It was situated immediately over the bedchamber in which Agnes had passed the night. For the last two days the room had been empty. The absence of luggage in it when they opened the door showed that it had not yet been let. "'You see,' said the countess, pointing to the carved figure at the fireplace. And you know what to do. Have I deserved that you should temper justice with mercy? She went on in lower tones. Give me a few more hours to myself. The baron wants money. I must get on with my play. 
She smiled vacantly, and imitated the action of writing with her right hand as she pronounced the last words. The effort of concentrating her weakened mind on other and less familiar topics than the constant want of money in the baron's lifetime, and the vague prospect of gain from the still unfinished play, had evidently exhausted her poor reserves of strength. When her request had been granted, she addressed no expressions of gratitude to Agnes. She only said, "'Feel no fear, miss, of my attempting to escape you. Where you are, there I must be till the end comes.' Her eyes wandered round the room with a last weary and stupefied look. She returned to her writing with slow and feeble steps, like the steps of an old woman." End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 Henry and Agnes were left alone in the room of the Caryatids. The person who had written the description of the palace, probably a poor author or artist, had correctly pointed out the defects of the mantelpiece, Bad taste, exhibiting itself on the most costly and splendid scale, was visible in every part of the work. It was, nevertheless, greatly admired by ignorant travellers of all classes, partly on account of its imposing size, and partly on account of the number of variously coloured marbles which the sculpture had contrived to introduce into his design. Photographs of the mantelpiece were exhibited in the public rooms, and found a ready sale among English and American visitors to the hotel. Henry led Agnes to the figure on the left as they stood facing the empty fireplace. "'Shall I try the experiment?' he asked. "'Or will you?' She abruptly drew her arm away from him and turned back to the door. "'I can't even look at it,' she said. "'That merciless marble face frightens me.' Henry put his hand on the forehead of the figure. "'What is there to alarm you, my dear, in this conventionally classical face?' he asked jestingly. Before he could press the head inwards, Agnes hurriedly opened the door. "'Wait till I'm out of the room,' she cried. "'The bare idea of what you may find there horrifies me.' She looked back into the room as she crossed the threshold. "'I won't leave you altogether,' she said. "'I will wait outside.' She closed the door. Left by himself, Henry lifted his hand once more to the marble forehead of the figure. For the second time he was checked on the point of setting the machinery of the hiding place in motion. On this occasion the interruption came from an outbreak of friendly voices in the corridor. A woman's voice exclaimed, "'Dearest Agnes, how glad I am to see you again!' A man's voice followed, offering to introduce some friend to Miss Lockwood, a third voice, which Henry recognized as the voice of the manager of the hotel, became audible next, directing the housekeeper to show the ladies and gentlemen the vacant apartments at the other end of the corridor. If more accommodation is wanted, the manager went on, I have a charming room to let here. He opened the door as he spoke, and found himself face to face with Henry Westwick. This is indeed an agreeable surprise, sir, said the manager cheerfully. You are admiring our famous chimney-piece, I see. May I ask, Mr. Westwick, how you find yourself in the hotel this time? Have the supernatural influences affected your appetite again? The supernatural influences have spared me this time, Henry answered. Perhaps you may yet find that they have affected some other member of the family. He spoke gravely, resenting the familiar tone in which the manager had referred to his previous visit to the hotel. "'Have you just returned?' he asked, by way of changing the topic. "'Just this minute, sir. I had the honour of travelling in the same train with friends of yours who have arrived at the hotel, Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Barville, and their travelling companions. Miss Lockwood is with them, looking at the rooms. They will be here before long, if they find it convenient to have an extra room at their disposal. This announcement decided Henry on exploring the hiding place before the interruption occurred. It had crossed his mind when Agnes left him that he ought perhaps to have a witness, in the not very probable event of some alarming discovery taking place. 
The too familiar manager, suspecting nothing, was there at his disposal. He turned again to the Carian figure, maliciously resolving to make the manager his witness. "'I am delighted to hear that our friends have arrived at last,' he said. "'Before I shake hands with them, let me ask you a question about this queer work of art here. I see photographs of it downstairs. Are they for sale?' "'Certainly, Mr. Westwick.' "'Do you think the chimney-piece is as solid as it looks?' Henry proceeded. "'When you came in, I was just wondering whether this figure here had not accidentally got loosened from the wall behind it.' He laid his hand on the marble forehead for the third time. "'To my eye, it looks a little out of the perpendicular. I almost fancied I could jog the head just now, when I touched it.' He pressed the head inwards as he said those words. A sound of jarring iron was instantly audible behind the wall. The solid hearthstone in front of the fireplace turned slowly at the foot of the two men and disclosed a dark cavity below. At the same moment, the strange and sickening combination of odors, hitherto associated with the vaults of the old palace and with the bedchamber beneath, now floated up from the open recess and filled the room. The manager started back. "'Good God, Mr. Westwick!' he exclaimed. "'What does this mean?' Remembering not only what his brother Francis had felt in the room beneath, but what the experience of Agnes had been on the previous night, Henry was determined to be on his guard. "'I am as much surprised as you are,' was his only reply." "'Wait for me one moment, sir,' said the manager. "'I must stop the ladies and gentlemen outside from coming in.' He hurried away, not forgetting to close the door after him. Henry opened the window and waited there, breathing the purer air. Vague apprehensions of the next discovery to come filled his mind for the first time. He was doubly resolved now not to stir a step in the investigation without a witness.' The manager returned with a wax taper in his hand, which he lighted as soon as he entered the room. "'We need fear no interruption now,' he said. "'Be so kind, Mr. Westwick, as to hold the light. It is my business to find out what this extraordinary discovery means.' Henry held the taper. Looking into the cavity, by the dim and flickering light, they both detected a dark object at the bottom of it. "'I think I can reach the thing,' the manager remarked, "'if I lie down and put my hand into the hole.' He knelt on the floor and hesitated. "'Might I ask you, sir, to give me my gloves?' he said. "'They are in my hat on the chair behind you.' Henry gave him the gloves. "'I don't know what I may be going to take hold of,' the manager explained, smiling rather uneasily as he put on his right glove. He stretched himself at full length on the floor and passed his right arm into the cavity. "'I can't say exactly what I have got hold of,' he said, "'but I have got it.' Half raising himself, he drew his hand out. The next instant he started to his feet with a shriek of terror. A human head dropped from his nerveless grasp on the floor and rolled to Henry's feet. It was the hideous head that Agnes had seen hovering above her in the vision of the night. The two men looked at each other, both struck speechless by the same emotion of horror. The manager was the first to control himself. "'See to the door, for God's sake,' he said. "'Some of the people outside may have heard me.' Henry moved mechanically to the door. Even when he had his hand on the key, ready to turn it in the lock in case of necessity, he still looked back at the appalling object on the floor. There was no possibility of identifying those decayed and distorted features with any living creature whom he had seen, and yet he was conscious of feeling a vague and awful doubt which shook him to the soul. The questions which had tortured the mind of Agnes were now his questions too. He asked himself— in whose likeness might I have recognized it before the decay set in? The likeness of Ferrari, or the likeness of— He paused, trembling, as Agnes had paused, trembling before him. 
Agnes, the name of all women's names, the dearest to him, was a terror to him now. What was he to say to her? What might be the consequence if he trusted her with the terrible truth? No footsteps approached the door, no voices were audible outside. The travellers were still occupied in the rooms at the eastern end of the corridor. In the brief interval that had passed, the manager had sufficiently recovered himself to be able to think once more of the first and foremost interests of his life, the interests of the hotel. He approached Henry anxiously. "'If this frightful discovery becomes known,' he said, "'the closing of the hotel and the ruin of the company will be the inevitable results. I feel sure that I can trust your discretion, sir, so far?' "'You can certainly trust me,' Henry answered. "'But surely discretion has its limits,' he added, "'after such a discovery as we have made.' The manager understood that the duty which they owed to the community as honest and law-abiding men was the duty to which Henry now referred. "'I will at once find the means,' he said, "'of conveying the remains privately out of the house, "'and I will myself place them in the care of the police authorities.' Will you leave the room with me, or do you not object to keep watch here and help me when I return? While he was speaking, the voices of the travellers made themselves heard again at the end of the corridor. Henry instantly consented to wait in the room. He shrank from facing the inevitable meeting with Agnes if he showed himself in the corridor at that moment. The manager hastened his departure in the hope of escaping notice. He was discovered by his guests before he could reach the head of the stairs. Henry heard the voices plainly as he turned the key. While the terrible drama of discovery was in progress on one side of the door, trivial questions about the amusements of Venice and facetious discussions on the relative merits of French and Italian cookery were proceeding on the other. Little by little the sound of the talking grew fainter. The visitors, having arranged their plans of amusement for the day, were on their way out of the hotel. In a minute or two there was silence once more. Henry turned to the window, thinking to relieve his mind by looking at the bright view over the canal. He soon grew wearied of the familiar scene. The morbid fascination which seems to be exercised by all horrible sights drew him back again to the ghastly object on the floor. Dream or reality, how had Agnes survived the sight of it? As the question passed through his mind, he noticed for the first time something lying on the floor near the head. Looking closer, he perceived a thin little plate of gold with three false teeth attached to it, which had apparently dropped out, loosened by the shock when the manager let the head fall on the floor. The importance of this discovery and the necessity of not too readily communicating it to others instantly struck Henry. Here surely was a chance, if any chance remained, of identifying the shocking relic of humanity which lay before him, the dumb witness of a crime. Acting on this idea, he took possession of the teeth, purposing to use them as a last means of inquiry when other attempts at investigation had been tried and had failed. He went back again to the window. The solitude of the room began to weigh on his spirits. As he looked out again at the view, there was a soft knock at the door. He hastened to open it and checked himself in the act. A doubt occurred to him. Was it the manager who had knocked? He called out. Who is there? The voice of Agnes answered him. Have you anything to tell me, Henry? He was hardly able to reply. "'Not just now,' he said confusedly. "'Forgive me if I don't open the door. I will speak to you a little later.' The sweet voice made itself heard again, pleading with him piteously. "'Don't leave me alone, Henry. I can't go back to the happy people downstairs.' How could he resist that appeal? He heard her sigh. He heard the rustling of her dress as she moved away in despair. The very thing that he had shrunk from doing but a few minutes since was the thing that he did now. He joined Agnes in the corridor. She turned as she heard him, and pointed, trembling in the direction of the closed room. "'Is it so terrible as that?' she asked faintly. He put his arm round her to support her. A thought came to him as he looked at her, waiting in doubt and fear for his reply. 
"'You shall know what I have discovered,' he said, "'if you will first put on your hat and cloak and come out with me.' She was naturally surprised. "'Can you tell me your object in going out?' she asked. He owned what his object was unreservedly. "'I want, before all things,' he said, "'to satisfy your mind and mine on the subject of Montbarry's death. "'I am going to take you to the doctor who attended him in his illness, "'and to the consul who followed him to the grave.' "'Her eyes rested on Henry gratefully. "'Oh, how well you understand me,' she said. "'The manager joined them at the same moment on his way up the stairs.' Henry gave him the key of the room, and then called to the servants in the hall to have a gondola ready at the steps. "'Are you leaving the hotel?' the manager asked. "'In search of evidence,' Henry whispered, pointing to the key. "'If the authorities want me, I shall be back in an hour.'" End of chapter 24